Welcome everyone to this um, FENIA panel, which is the first FENIA panel ever organized. So uh, let's see how it goes, really interesting. Um, I will say just a very few words about the journal because it's probably more or less familiar to you. This is the 134th year of, of uh, publishing FENIA and I'm uh, Kiesi Pannakalli, I'm the editor-in-chief of the journal. And uh, I'm very proud about the journal's uh, open um, agenda and open practices. We uh, try to develop the journal um, constantly uh, to different directions of, of doing it openly, uh, free to everyone, free of charge, free of, uh, uh, of any access uh, issues. And um, to us, the most important thing is to place scholars at the center of scientific publishing, uh, not anybody else. And this means also sharing responsibilities in all the publication processes. So we, uh, because we all work more or less on a voluntary basis, not non-commercial. This this must be Springer or Elsevier disrupting. So so um, so. We, we try to organize all our processes so that uh, nobody gets burdened by the work um, of um, FENIA, not the authors, not the editors, not the peer reviewers, and that it would be reward, rewarding to everyone, the processes. And um, we uh, work in, in collaboration with the, the Versus um, uh, online uh, popular research-based um, uh, publication and also this um, um, panel is organized in collaboration with Versus and will feed into into that um, uh, forum as well. And uh, I was meaning to say when we started, but I'll say it now that uh, we are um, we are um, uh, videoing the whole panel. Uh, so if you uh, post questions from the audience, they will also go to the video and the video will be published at the Versus uh, web page right away. Uh, and then later on, we will also produce some texts, text and debates there. So that's that's more or less about FENIA. This is the uh, FENIA's uh, editorial board and editors. Oh press there I guess yeah um, so with me um, there are uh, four other editors these days um, um, editing the journal James writing who's really sorry that he couldn't be here he really, really wanted to come but couldn't come for um, overlapping commitments uh, he's um, nowadays in Newcastle in the UK uh, Maya Hallonen who is here uh, Maya uh, is our managing editor so takes care of everything that uh, that things get uh, produced in the journal and, and James is uh, responsible for the reflection section. section. Um, then uh, Leni Herala, who is not here today, uh, she's our copy editor and takes care of all the finalization of the, of the pieces. And then Mira Ulisari is our societal uh, impact editor uh, working in Versus and, and responsible for the popularization um, and circulation of the broader circulation of the, of the publication. Um, this doesn't... Oh, there it is. So um, we publish in three different categories. We'll not go deeper into that. Uh, this panel will probably produce three essays, uh, which would be my my desire. Three essays and um, two commentaries from the commentators here, and then uh, also commentaries from the peer review process. So we will come up with a rich discussion, hopefully, for next year's um, first issue. Uh, these are our previous lectures. So previously we have organized uh, FENIA lectures, not panels. And this year we wanted to uh, enrich this um, discussion a bit further. Uh, last year we were in Tampere uh, with Ilse van Liebt as our, um, always forget, as our um, keynote. And we have published um, her lecture in our um, uh, latest um, issue. And um, with three commentaries by um, Melody Sommelier, Aura Lonasma, and Catherine Mitchell. And we will have another fourth um, commentary coming up by Camila Marocco in one of our um, forthcoming issues. So that's the latest one that we did um, last year. And um, this year, we will have the panel if the computer allows. <laughs> I don't know how to use it, I guess. <laughs> Is it happening? Go ahead. So this is our panel. Um, the theme of the panel um, is uh, planetary urbanism. Um, 
the broad context of this FANIA panel, contemporary planetary turn, identified by critical scholars, specialists from various fields, NGOs, intergovernmental bodies, politicians and civil society actors across the world. It refers to what geographers often call scale jump, that is, a shift of spatial attention. Uh, in this case, the jump is perhaps most importantly from scales such as global and transnational to the planetary perspective. While the uh, shift may first seem semantic, uh, those attentive to the current environmental situation of the globe see it fundamental. fundamental. Whereas globalization draws attention to the global mobilities of people, goods and ideas with strong emphasis on the economy and the capitalist world order, transnationalization stresses the changing connections and disruptions between states, primarily political power relations between them, but acknowledging also cultural and social dimensions of the constantly transforming relational world. Both concepts are often coupled with the idea of translocalization, where scalar attunement is towards cities, city regions and other regions and localities that together form um, economically, politically, socially and culturally significant spatial configurations. Diverging from these, uh, the planetary turn urges us to see the world as a living environment consisting of fragile ecosystems that humans, among other species, are completely dependent on. A concern broadly shared by planetarists is that tipping points in the human-induced destruction of the planet are close, if not already at hand. Brought together with the translocal perspective, this worry gets an urban face. The overconsumption of the world's resources takes place in urban centers, making the production of carbon emissions an urban matter, similarly to nature loss that actually happens mostly alarming, most alarmingly beyond um, urban uh, agglomerations. Uh, major urban areas are connected through worldwide city regional networks, driven by capitalist logics with an obvious northern western tilt, and leaving other areas disconnected and de depriving. Currently, the whole planet is made to serve the increasingly rapid urbanization, which is leading to the collapse of ecosystems in various locations, to irreversible climate change with earth-shattering earth consequences and to deepening inequalities between places and people. To stop and reverse this development, a radical change from globalization and transnationalization towards planetary balance and justice is needed. It needs to build on viable ecosystems and socially just environmental sustainability through urban change. So the panel discusses these and other aspects of the planetocene from urban perspectives. And let me introduce the, the panelists very briefly. Uh, Sala Alamantila uh, is our first panelist. She is assistant professor at the Faculty of Bioenvironmental Sciences uh, at the Helsinki University and affiliate uh, of the Helsinki Institute of Sustainability Science. Uh, Tarmo Pikna is senior researcher at the School of Humanities at Tallinn University, Estonia. And we just counted that this is uh, the 25th year of uh, Thalmos participation in the Finnish Geography Days. Was that right? Not every year, but 25 but, years ago was first time here in Jones. That's a long time here in Jones. <laughs> 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 and then our third panelist uh, is uh, participating remotely due to um, um, uh, getting sick last night. And, but she is with us here today, Bozu Yigitura. Uh, and uh, Busu is a senior lecturer in the subject area of planning in uh, cultural environments at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, SMU, in Sweden. Welcome, Busu. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you very as, much. Yes. And as our commentators, we have uh, Maja Kuivalainen, who is city councillor uh, and urban structure committee member in Joensuu uh, uh, and environmental policy student here at the University of Eastern Finland. And uh, then we have Tero Mustonen, uh, founder and president of the Snow Change uh, Cooperative. And as many of you may know, uh, Tero was uh, awarded uh, this year the Goldman, uh, Goldman Environmental Prize. So this is our panel. And um, without further ado, uh, let's start by uh, Sanna's um, presentation that he showed from the other two people. So the structure is such that we will have the panelists' um, presentations, then we'll have the comments by the commentators, and then we'll have a, an open floor for <coughs> questions and answers. Do you speak or do I stay here? Uh, you stay there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> for the camera. <laughs> okay, so thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's nice to be here. It's my first time in the geography day, so let's see how it goes. 
you can then comment later. Uh, I, I will talk about planetary urbanism from my perspective and based on what kind of studies I have done. Uh, but I want to start with the uh, quick introduction about the role of urban in climate change, because I think it nicely visualizes or illustrates the idea. Uh, we all probably know that cities do have an important role. Ah. Uh, in climate change related issues these days. Uh, but it hasn't been like that always. Of course, cities have been discussed in this context. But for example, I think it's interesting to note that, uh, for example, Agenda 21, the UN uh, document from the 90s, they uh, discuss cities in a much more critical tone, for example, saying that the in industrialized countries, uh, the consumption patterns of mostly urban cities and urban citizens are stressing the global environment and global ecosystems. So the idea is already there. But these days, these, for example, these official uh, agendas, they are much more focused on the uh, possibilities of cities. Uh, for example, we have this SDG, SDG uh, target list and they have this own own goal that is related to cities SDG, SDG 11 and there they highlight what kind of changes we need to achieve in cities in order to they can act as some kind of solutions to the climate change. There is a lot of talk about like inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable cities and human settlements and what kind of planning practices would lead to that. However, the shift has Change from solutions, uh, from problems, problems to the solutions, I could say. Uh, why is it this are important in climate change? Is because when adaptation, it's natural that many of the cities are very uh, uh, endangered by the proceeding climate change and because of their locations in the coastal areas and so on. So that's why the adaptation is needed, but also mitigation. Of course, cities are not, uh, they are doing local actions to mitigate the global problem. So always these actions are not uh, leading to any visible consequences for the citizens involved, but they are needed because of the substantial amount of urban populations. And also because, uh, especially in the economic, cities are seen as these kind of Hubs of innovation and productivity. So, from that reason, we can think that okay, cities are places where these kind of innovations can take uh, that can help us in combating climate change can take place. So, and we escape to other places. So, so they could have this impact larger than the actual size and scale. And a lot of academic discussion also about this uh, importance of kind of local versus global, with, which is the most effective in the face of environmental crisis and so on. Uh, many political scientists might say that decentralized actions are the key areas, for example, if you ask from an economist how to combat climate change, they might say that uh, the most effective way is through all kind of very global and large scale uh, uh, policies, such as carbon taxation, uh, carbon markets, carbon pricing, these kind of things. So there, there are different ideas related to this. Okay. And uh, what about the, this planetary turn? Uh, well, we can say that in, in academic discussions, it's even, uh, it dates even more back in the history than it dates in the UN documents. For example, this idea about cities as ecosystems is perhaps presented in already in the 60s in the meta in the idea of metabolism of cities 
highlight, highlighting that cities are these kind of nodes of material and energy flows from them to outside them. So they are not self-sufficient in any sense. And you can, uh, you can understand cities and urban areas as flows, flows of people, flows of resources, flows of energy, emissions and goods, whatever. So the idea has been there for a long time. Uh, however, perhaps planetary urbanization argues this even clearer, saying that the, this kind of traditional notion of urban development, uh, it's not making sense anymore. So we need to expand it and understand that cities have impact beyond their borders, affecting the entire planets and their ecosystems. And this means, for example, or this is caused by intensification of global infrastructure, globalization, and interactions, uh, interaction flows between people and businesses and all, all units, basically. And where this is also visible is that uh, it means that urbanization spatial changes are not confined to cities, so they in influence the areas within the same countries, beyond the city border, but also in in other countries. So, so has argued that this means that we are transforming these areas outside urban areas into agricultural expanses, data storage sites, or resource peripheries, peripheries for example. And my background is in uh, uh, carbon footprints. Uh, this is, I think it's one application that kind of nicely uh, shows what this is about. Because sometimes understanding these kind of more theoretical ideas such as planetary urbanization is a bit hard, at least for me. So this is, uh, I think, an application that kind of nicely highlights the idea. You can talk about carbon or biodiversity or ecological footprint, but you all are having the same idea that you calculate somehow what kind of pressure the consumption within city borders or whatever borders you are using is causing globally, so outside the borders as well. And in these studies, the result is always that urban footprints are much higher when uh, calculated with this kind of consumption based methodology compared to the traditional way of production based methodology. And this is also a, the result in Finland. However, uh, I found this nice study from last year uh, where they calculated uh, these carbon footprints of 90 developing countries because there's much less, much less results from these outside the global north context. So this, this was something new, I think. And there they also find the same result that usually the urban footprints are higher, but also some, something that wasn't kind of behaving in that way. So in this first category, the red bar is the uh, higher one and it's rural footprint in these higher income developing countries, of course. So these were countries like Egypt, Egypt or uh, Mexico and so on. So there were some, some differences to this. But anyhow, I think the important result is that uh, if we are aiming for sustainable level of emissions, it's usually around two tons of CO2 emissions. And only these, like the most uh, the poorest of these countries, were approximately in that level already. So it's it's a high task. It's a like a big task for everyone to achieve that. And also, my relatively recent study shows this. Uh, here we calculated uh, emissions by downscaling the 1.5 degree target to individual scale, meaning that what if we divide the emissions that we can emit to each individual uh, equally in, in the countries, and then based on like how many citizens you have in, in your country, then the larger the footprint can be, but the global share is kind of equal. And then you can see from this figure, how large is the oversight in some of the countries. Well, these countries that are uh, like, emitting the most that are like further in this scale of uh, carbon footprint that is down here. These are countries that are more, most urbanized, urbanized and most developed. 
in many measures. Running out of time, so I need to. So it definitely definitely means that uh, there is something we need to do for this. And so I see that planetary urbanization is important idea that underscores this interconnectedness of these environmental challenges, which are often global but manifested locally. And what they also kind of highlight is that we need to be critical when we look at these city level targets and local sustainability strategies, because of course they are also having important aims, but they are not taking at all account these kind of environmental problems caused outside their borders elsewhere. And this also raises the question about the equity of sub initiative. So is it focusing only, only on the local needs and not taking any stance on the local uh, global environmental justice? But also I think it uh, it kind of nicely uh, uh, combines that if you take this lens of planetary urbanization, it nicely combines that uh we need to have this kind of social spatial justice lens on when we are looking at these issues because uh these uh these kind of having these kind of viewpoints could perhaps alleviate for example the regional differences and divisions that we already have in the eu or globally as and within within individual countries and perhaps within individual cities as well so we need to kind of Try to have this more holistic view. Thank you very much, Sana. What an inspiring start for our for our, for our panel. <laughs> so uh, next we have um, Tarmos' um, presentation. <coughs> so good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Um, and um, uh, resonance of planetary and commons within uh, evolving urbanism. <clears throat> As it already said in the introduction, the shift from a global case towards um, planetary entanglements of urban brings up multiple agencies and scales. It can become linked to rural uh, seascapes or underground mines. And the paper asks, uh, um, how urban spheres resonate along significant environmental changes in intersecting diverse disturbances more than humans and anticipated uh, futures. Uh, this paper analyzes uh, these resonances uh, by focusing on uh, volumetric spaces, contested commons and rural urban relations affecting uh, transformations and of urbanism. I, I will elaborate this perspective along three vignettes uh, of coastal assemblages linking waste, birds, and energy to urbanism. Urbanization should be understood beyond the institutional borders and forms of the city, as, as you already also noted. Uh, beside dominant urban case, we could talk also about ruralization of, of words, approaching urbanism and urbanization through the lens of planet Planetarity keeps alterity open and can indicate ways humans inhabit wider systems as planetary subjects rather than global agents. This perspective on planetary urbanism decenters human agency relating to Earth and terrains. Uh, according to uh, Bruno Tour, tendencies of modernization push towards global human agency generated an excessive burden upon the Earth. He argues that. To think globally and to bear on his or her shoulders the entire weight of the globe, that strange Western obsession. So instead of a kind of domination of, of, of the, on the globe, uh, uh, the sphere-based or, or kind of volumetric perspective is useful for analyzing resonances of planetarity in urbanization because extended urbanism forms relations between humans and their surrounding environments through what materialized atmospheres and also rural urban relations uh, can become part of these spheres having certain ruptures and emergent expectations in context of the crisis. And uh, 
And if you talk about the planetary urbanism, of course, uh, that is uh, possible to see also this kind of uh, spheres of ignorance or agnotocene, which, which uh, uh, ignore this wider uh, nature-culture relations. So first, I uh, next I turn to this uh, free encounters, uh, uh, first wastelands and deep time of urbanization. No, sorry. Uh, the hill of uh, Silama Waste uh, Depository is located near Baltic Sea, the industrial harbor and the town facilities. The layers of this artificial mountain contains hundreds of tons of toxic and nuclear waste generated by the oil cell processing nuclear fuel production and production of rare uh, metals in Soviet era. The first Soviet at atomic bombs probably used nuclear material produced in Silama. Besides that, the depository exists also underground caves and ash hills of oil shale mining in Estonia, which can be considered as a materialized wastelands of expanding towns and industries, which demanded more and more energy. The collapse of Iron Curtain made visible the environmental catastrophe related to this military energy assemblage and evolvement of the town. The Nordic Joint Mission did encapsulate the entire radio radioactive depository in different layers of insulate, insulating material that should guarantee the stabilization of the site for the next 1,000 years. The time horizon of millennium and the 5 million years old Cambrian blue clay become linked to the urban materialized atmospheres, which usually operate on much shorter time horizons of decades or a century. The production of rare earth Metals continues in Silama today with the raw uh, material coming from Africa and Latin America. Besides the nuclear legacies, the city realized its ambition plan to build a coastal promenade connecting to the city center uh, to the waterfront. However, the socio-environmental disturbances in the town continue to ha haunt and limit imaginings of the special futures, the zones of ignorance and landscape scars uh, become exploited in the public discourse to allocate wind parks, extended industries, and possible nuclear possible nuclear power plant in the area. So the second uh, encounter, uh, living with uh, birds in in age of the city, the coastal terrain of North Tallinn is forming is a former enclosed coastal border zone and currently part of Natura 2000 bird protection area. The settings made the rare birds as Sterna paradisia visible in urban nature assemblages and provided some agency to speak in the name of non-humans. The nature conservation on this Tallinn's peninsula has some tensions with surfers, dog owners, real estate agencies, nudists and city planners. The pressure of this kind of green areas did grow, particularly during the COVID-19 restrictions on traveling. Bird watching enthusiasts can be seen as one community of practice that makes the rich ecosystem of mi migrating birds visible through the activity of mapping, which includes watching and counting birds at particular locations. The passionate activity has indicated uh, distributed flyways where the peninsula functions as a migration corridor and uh, foraging site for migrating birds. Kind of volumetric boundaries of nature protection extending to marine and to airspace became formed through the dynamic process. The establishment of artificial islands has been negotiated to achieve the compromise between the new casinos and protecting of feeding grounds of the migratory birds. Kind of this coastal terrain, uh, terrain in the city indicates distinctive ruptures of regime and of related landscapes. That, way, uh, that there is a challenge to observe and understand disturbance-based uh, ecologies, uh, what Anna Singh argues, in which many species live together without either harmony or conquest. Disturbance can be seen as a usual components of living environments which generate complex entanglement, entanglements between ecologies and social practice. So, very briefly, third encounter energy scapes. Uh, 
related to urbanization uh, that um, uh, Pirat, as an inhabitant of the island, is worried about the planned offshore wind energy park in proximity marine space in Hiuma, which is western western coast island of Estonia. She contributed significantly to the court case against the developer and Estonian state, which uh, postponed wind park planning, but did not stop the whole process. The Hiuma case of offshore wind energy planning has influenced how the role of existing marine data is valued in impact assessments and poss possibilities to interpret conflicts along blue justice framework are, are, are possible. Also, kind of, it is possible to, uh, to say that territorialization of marine space for extracting wind energy includes sea volumes along deep underwater sea base, uh, uh, surface conditions, and aerial uh, space. And uh, this kind of urbanized straight strata became visible along a broken gas pipe between Estonia and Finland. And several uh, months earlier, the explosion of Nord Stream gas pipe generated worldwide debates about energy security uh, during and after the war. So to conclude um, uh, this uh, short uh, uh, paper, uh, these three vignettes about coastal assemblages of politics indicate that urbanization generates and is projected along volumetric spatiality extending beyond surfaces of land and city borders. Sphere like fatalities are part of meaning making and life support systems and can contribute to extracting new resources and also in protecting particular nature habitats. This perspective contributes in understanding the complex processes, processes of internalization and ongoing socialization bound to uh, urbanism. Planetary urbanism appears in translating earthbound connections into urban chains and negotiating the role of humans in these processes. The spheres of ignorance or agnotocene is evident in global urbanization forming cities as parasites, which depend heavily on faraway resources and waste dumps. However, my paper indicates that some zones of ignorance may turn into places of nature culture care, triggering practice towards conviviality. The, multi the current multiple crisis bring in forefront time perspective of urbanism. The current multiple um, time dimension and events in common in process because during crisis, new entanglements to neighbors, uh, uh, to neighbors and earth may appear and rural urban relations may, may be shifting. These emergent entanglements can be ignored or made part of better planetary uh, futures. For example, the framework of degrowth as a gradual decreasing of consumption and introducing circular rationality in design would open some new trajectories of urbanism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan, for what an intriguing uh, and with, with such interesting examples. Uh, uh, I'm just thrilled about this, this richness that we are receiving here. So next we have the third panelist, Bursu Nijit Turan. Bursu, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, I'm showing your slides from here, and I'm guessing when to change the slide, but you can also uh, say when you want me to change. So we are now looking at the title, uh, so you can um, introduce your paper and, and then we'll move on to the first slide. Uh, in my paper, I will try to um, underline the gap regarding theories that theorization and um, practice in planning uh, field uh, regarding the debates of uh, planetary urbanization. In the face of intersecting social and environmental crisis, the theory of planetary urbanization became a platform for discussing the role of unevenly woven cities and urbanization processes beyond the limits of the city in ongoing global transformations. Its focus on accumulation by disposition has galvanized debates on privatization, inclusion of public commons, gentrification, social and 
technological degradation and intersecting crisis. The theory challenged the binary view of urban rural, the Cartesian discrete understanding of space. However, the universalist totalizing Euro-American centered perspective brought by Brenner and Schmidt was critiqued by post-colonial, anti-colonial, black, feminist, queer, non-post-human uh, positionings. Similarly, <clears throat> the discourse of the Anthropocene has been critiqued for its white supremacist, Eurocentric and colonial legacies in geography. Urban and environmental theories that have already challenged some of the problematizations brought by planetary urbanization include Lefebvre's urban revolution, black urban sociology and geography, studies of environmental and spatial racism, critical studies of socio-spatial whiteness and gender studies, as well as decolonial theory. These theories have generated epistemological advancements that have been partially debated within the umbrella of planetary urbanization. For example, the studies of race and city and the socio-spatial epistemology of whiteness, the non-relational essentialist dehistoricized theorization of space were problematized. The lack of performative, relational, and historicized understanding of inequality and injustice have been already proposed in environmental and spatial racism studies. The scholars have discussed the racial spatial formation and co-constitution of space and race, as well as racial capitalism and its impact on urbanization. The term racial capitalism has gained attention within academic circles as a conceptual framework for understanding the intersectionality of race and capitalism in the current era. Coined by Cedric J. Robinson, this concept seeks to examine how racial inequalities are not only perpetrated, but also reinforced and intensified by the capitalist system. Racial capitalism argues that capitalism triumphs of racial divisions and hierarchies, utilizing racial labor exploitation to fuel its profit-driving dynamics. It emphasizes the historical development of capitalism alongside the racialization of labor, where certain racial and ethnic groups are systematically marginalized and exploited for economic gains. This framework challenges the notion that capitalism is a race-neutral system, revealing how racial identities are not mere coincidences, but integral components of capitalist structures. Relatedly, the concept of racial capital capitalism seeks to unveil the ways in which racialization and racial hierarchies operate within global capitalism. It highlights how racialized individuals and communities disproportionately bear, bear the burdens of economic exploitation, resource extraction, and environmental degradation associated with capitalist practices. Moreover, this framework underscores the interconnectedness of racialized ex exploitation and environmental crisis, exposing the racial dimensions of climate change, pollution, and other ecological issues. I'm particularly interested in exploring the possibilities offered by black Marxist and anti-colonial theories of racial capitalism and decolonial theories to problematize the spatial myopia within Swedish theory in the face of planetary, environmental and social crisis. By highlighting the gap, I aim to develop a call for a multi-scalar planetary urban theory, history and practice within the Swedish context. The racial capitalism perspective not only reveals the racism within the process of accumulation by disposition, but also explains how these processes are rationalized, formalized, and reproduced through different forms of racism in the planning process. Swedish cities are usually theorized and historicized within the Eurocentric modernist industrial city paradigm, which gained contextual nuances through 20th century social democratic welfare projects creating an impression that Swedish cities were exceptional in relation to planetary processes. The urban morphology is 
predominantly historicized without considering an outside. Is this the case with contemporary rhetoric on socially and environmentally sustainable urban development? White anxiety surrounding social security, social diversity, and climate change infiltrate into instrumentalized theories. The notions of social mixing, the security and connectivity oriented compact city uh, epistemology with neo green urbanist undertones the dominant concept in planning theory and practice under the umbrella of sustainable urban development. Despite the dominance of this epistemology, urban sprawl is still advancing as the parallel epistemology usually in justified with eco-modernist discourses. Although there is Ongoing scholarship on the neoliberalization of the housing market, segregation, privatization of commons, and racial stigmatization of places, there is still a dominance of colorblind, politi political economy blind, sustainability, social diversity approaches, methodological cynicism, nationalism, and a lack of nuance in understanding process of racialization particularly capturing different forms of racism and the ways in which racial capitalism unfolds in the urban space. It is crucial to analyze the role and internal functioning of planning as a mediator between larger socio-political and spatial material processes and local. Today, these aforementioned socio-spatial epistemologies are embedded in the urban rural space along racial lines. The so-called socially diverse and immigrant program post for modernist estates are intervened with large densification oriented, neo-urbanist, connectivity oriented, extractivist projects in the name of countering segregation and um, social sustainability. Justified with eco-modernist rhetoric, supposedly aimed at environmental sustainability, the rural peripheries have become part of further urban sprawl with the development of low density single family housing areas, which historically align with the concept of white flight. Despite being discussed by several researchers, these areas have the largest environmental footprints as eco modernist solutions depend on materials extracted from the peripheries inside and outside. <coughs> Swedish sociologists argue that the regimes of neighborhood disinvestment and extraction-oriented investment, symbolic and material disposal and accumulation are highly racialized. Through their black Marxist analysis, Swedish sociologists Lenari and Nergard calls exploitative and exclu exclusionary racism in the labor market and welfare structures. These processes reproduce racialized cities and landscapes, segregation, and consequently social and environmental injustice. As a result, natural spaces, seen as an added value for the commercialization of housing, become a question of privilege and exclusion in segregated cities and further create meanings. Who is entitled to space and nature? Planning epistemology in Sweden can be described as white with non-relational, non-performative, or historical, deterministic, and essentialist socio-spatial epistemologies, methodological cynicism, and nationalism, as well as Nordic exceptionalism, are also prevalent. Inequalities are mapped in the city analysis without considering wider historical and socio-political context and different areas of the city are not recognized as they are recognized as discrete spaces infiltrated by various racial imaginaries, white supremacy, privilege, saviorism, and ever-changing categorization that versus discrimination against non-white individuals. These imaginaries are and problem formulations are then used as pretext for based epistemologically differentiated urban development schemes that facilitate accumulation by disposition. As a result, the phenomenon of green gentrification 
perpetuates on a city-wide scale. Racialized accumulation by dispossession and colonialism become a continuum that permeates the global and local, while the discourse of the Anthropocene creates an undifferentiated, abstract, universally socially undifferentiated narrative about the history of climate change and ecological destruction. Rethinking empirical observations on contemporary urbanization in cities like Uppsala and Ma <coughs> within, uh, within an uh, anti colonial black Marxist uh, feminist queer planetary urbanization theory reveals the existing existence of racial capitalism in Swedish urbanization and perhaps a planetary colonial continuum. It exposes the perpetuation of racial injustice and highlights the sciences, blind points, and compliances in planning epistemology and practices. This rethinking also emphasized the urgent necessity of reconstructing urban planning history, theory, and practice to discuss contextual nuances without falling into abstraction and universalism. It also raises important questions such as how can the welfareist, modernist city history and the current sustainable urban development narrative in the Nordic context be rewritten? How can Nordic or Swedish cities be historicized and theorized within the inclusion of an outside or multiple outsides? How can such history and theory be mobilized in planning theory and practice to claim planetary global and local socio-spatial and environmental justice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bojo, for an inspiring, really inspiring talk. And uh, now we move to the comments and uh, we decided that um, Dero will offer his comments first to all panelists and then Maya after that. So go ahead, Dero. We're a bit uh, after schedule, so about 10 minutes. Is that a um, finish 10 minutes or? Well, I have a flag. <laughs> okay. Well, good evening, everybody. And, and thank you to the chair and thank you to the geographical days and, and for having me. And uh, let me just first say that I'm probably in the completely wrong panel because I know nothing of cities. Um, I come from a small village of Selkie, which is, of course, close by, but uh, uh, you can still vote me out, so it's... Uh... Let's see what happens. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, I want to thank the panelists so far. Um, I will try to offer some points of reflection. From the work that I do, um, I have two jobs, so I'm probably the only professional fisher um, in the panel. I don't know if, if uh, you have picked up something last week, but uh, nevertheless, that's how I earn my living. Uh, but I every once in a while dabble in the world of science as well. So, and coming back here feels, of course, always like a home. Um, I defended here my thesis 2009 and and so on. Um, listening to these points or presentations, I came up with six reflections that I would like to bring here. In the village of Selkia, we have a saying that uh, it works in practice, but does it work in theory? And that's kind of where I'm coming from in the in these dark times, as you have called it in the panel, we have the planetary crisis and all sorts of other issues that we are tackling. But um, perhaps when I was listening to these ways and, and reflections on how the cities are defining and, and uh, I like the idea of city metabolism uh, with the surrounding areas, I'm firstly reminded by, for example, the wor work of Ari Augusti Lehtinen, who incidentally was my uh, thesis supervisor, so I have to uh, raise a hat to you as well, but uh, he has been writing in some of his peatland work about this double dissonance. And what I mean in this context and in our panel regarding this notion of how how the modernity or urbanism and city-based um, 
ordering of space and time and scales <clears throat> may produce a kind of twin or, or double dissonance to those that are not living in cities. And we could ask what is the responsibility of a city to its surrounding areas. As we heard, the food security and many services in cities are and urban areas are fully dependent on, on that metabolism. But uh, uh, we didn't hear what is the responsibility of the cities if they are dependent. And this notion of double dissonance really means that in the first wave of how urbanization happened, for example, in this country, um, the local communities, whether they are Sami or, or Finnish villages, they were told that their ways of, uh, or modes of life, life ways, are not really very significant. The progress is here, electricity is here, decrease are here. It's important to talk about the decrease in a university. And what you had, potentially your knowledge or heritage, becomes redundant in the new world where we are living. That's kind of the first act of power or disassociating uh, the people from the, the um, newly arriving futures. And secondly, the same landscapes that the city is uh, dependent on, for example, peatland for water purity or forests for um, in the early days, firewood and nowadays economy and so on, they are named, they are renamed. So reality, it's a double whacking. Those that were living in that place, who know the place, are being told what you knew is redundant from our viewpoint. And secondly, um, we can name and rename the species or the ecosystems or the landscapes in ways that doesn't, uh, or it's not compatible with the ways you are knowing the place. And I'm then leading to the middle part of my comments, which is kind of what I'm what I was trying to listen when when and when I was reading this, which is the power of cities, the power of um, um, how the agenda is set by our urban urbanism or the crises that may be felt in the cities. Um, Canadian media researcher Marshall McLuhan has coined the term medium is the message. And I think it's really important to wake up and realize how much are we propagating the crises by critically studying them, looking at them from all sorts of indicators, planetary justice, moving on from the urban into the planetary field and globalized fields and so on. And are we losing touch with reality in that um, process? So kind of my meta-level question is that in these new complex ways of studying, are we propagating futures and ways of knowing that are uh, still retaining the power of the city? They are still letting the city define or the urbanism or whatever you want to say, the agenda. This leads to my reflections on, on works by Annette Watson, for example, and of course, Foucault has been writing uh, quite a large, quite <laughs> extensively on the role of power and knowledge. And I'm afraid that a lot of our present day crises are actually propagated by us thinking too com in a too complex ways. That's why I comment Tarmo on your uh, post-Soviet uh, marking of the atomic waste dump. And I was extremely happy you also mentioned clay. So you demonstrated that that you have knowledge of nature and how how to contain atomic waste and, and what are the parameters of uh, um, tackling that interface between environmental problems with what I would call knowledge that is based on reality. How many minutes is that? About three. Okay. Three and a half. Okay, great. <laughs> um, I only have uh, 17 points to go, so... Um, We'll publish them all. Yeah, of course. Um, Annette Watson and Orwell Huntington have been calling reflections, which is moving on in, into the world of geography in this post-human term, where the Enlightenment produced, the, again, setting the power and the narrative of what constitutes culture. 
and and uh, humanism and and uh, i think th these are uh, questions that when i was studying these i took a journey to the city I, i'm very thankful for all the panelists for enabling it i had never thought of the city metabolism for example i found it greatly fascinating uh, but i also found that uh, these are propagated by the elites. These are propagated by um, analyst, analytical thoughts that are um, in the city. And I think that's really important to understand. How did Rome fall? If we think of the previous round of empire falling, of course it has been contested by many, many sides. It starts from here. Are we doubling and playing two mindful games why reality already goes ahead? Uh, I would be embracing what the, the last panelist said that about Sweden, that we have to understand history in order to find the solutions um, for today. And my fear is that we are lost in the cacophony. Everybody of every one of us who work in the world of science and geography ha have to have um, a view and then we have to have a sub view and criticism and post human animal studies and and uh, post um, post post human studies <laughs> and there's a trap there where i end so in order to wake up and realize how that city met metabolism will die if the surrounding uh, natural systems will fall, we have to have a new way of understanding the earth. And that will require us to go back to basics, water, electricity, biodiversity, and so on. And I would urge us to think about them, the basic facts like Tarmo gave us the wonderful view of the created nature and also the legacy of atomic waste. And Sanna gave us the pulse of the cities. So I'm here as a visitor, and this was my 10 minutes or 11, and I thank you for this chance. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Tero, for the most thought-provoking um, commentaries. I, I agree with so many of your points, and it would be intriguing to, to continue this discussion. But now we have uh, Maya's comments. Go ahead, and it will be really uh, interesting to hear uh, how these um, uh, scientific um, um, proposals uh, sound to you uh, coming uh, largely from um, uh, the so-called society, where politics is actually uh, in very practical ways done. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you can maybe hear me. Oh yeah, it's on. So, good evening, everybody. Hyvä ilta, tere öhtyst, i aksumlar, if I say it right. Um, I'm Maja Kuivalainen and I'm a city councillor from the city of Joensu and also a member of the Urban Structure Committee of Joensu. So these topics are very near to me in many ways within my work, my trustee position, but also within my studies of environmental policy and law here at the University of Eastern Finland. And as a politician with this hat on, I feel like this uh, session has already given me a lot. And I feel like I would love to mainly ask questions and not to comment and say, what do I think? Because I think that the role of us, the role of politicians should be more to educate ourselves, to learn and take these insights, insights with us when I go back to work. So I will just reflect something maybe more in general, but I want to thank our wonderful panelists and my fellow commentator Tero for sharing their knowledge because this is one of my main re reflections, knowledge, and how we can make our cities more uh, profoundly wise, not only smart in uh, digitalized or in technological way, but also in this deep wisdom that Tero also um, uh, mentioned that we need to think about reality and we need to think about the wisdom our elders our indigenous peoples and the people with traditions have and also in collaboration use that to solve our common crisis we are facing today here together here at the at the session and this uh assembly and the whole uh finnish 
geographical days. So thank you all for being here. And if I go a bit deeper to this uh, term of white cities and the evol evolution in the role of in the role of cities, um, I think that um, also we need to think about um, the power and the responsibility, the relation between responsibility and justice. So as Sanna mentioned, the global justice term, I was thinking about the sentence, we need to think globally and act, act locally. It's very well known for all of us, I guess. But I think there is more layers within this sentence that we need to understand also it in the bold ways, also about the reality and what is enough and what is our fair share within these crises. So also that, for example, me as a politician, I can demand all the people, all the citizens of Joensu to do the same things, that we need to think about what is the fair share and what are the relations between people who live within in the heart of the city and also people who live by in the nature areas, in the neighborhoods and in the urban, uh, sorry, I mean rural areas. and. And when we think about this evolution, we need more scientists and more researchers. So this is my call to action for you, my old colleagues, that as we heard from the uh, first session today and the opening from Mr. Rob Kinching, it was very, very delightful to hear that he also um, um, discussed about the different roles of researchers and the scientists and the whole uh, university community. So I hope that we could have more advocate researcher, researchers and more advocate scientists as well, because we need people to have these changes to happen to solve this crisis. We need people in all the places. So we need these people who are these friendly uh, people who criticize the system, but also activists and advocate uh, researchers who are more active and who are more uh, in touch with the policymakers and with the people in power. And also these scientists and researchers who may take uh, kind of like a healthy um, distance to the politics as well. So we need people in these all places, and I want to highlight this for all of you, that it was very, very delightful to hear. And about Dharma's uh, speech, what I, what are my remarks are this beyond human and beyond human-centered um, politics and planning and decisions. So I think that we also should think about who are we planning the cities for? We should have the big, pitch, big picture all the time. And we should also do more collaboration, interdisciplinary collaboration between different specialists, different uh, researchers and scientists, and also the citizens. So for example, as a city councillor, I made this initiative to have this citizens panel here in Joensu and to more include and more uh, involve our citizens in the policy making and the decision making. So that's how we can also find this social justice part, what is very important to make our uh, decisions more um, acceptable for the citizens and to also prevent this kind of like uh, conflicts and kind of um, uh, trouble and prob problems within the city planning. So the, the citizens can feel like they can also have their voice be, being heard and they can take, um, they can also uh, attend these kind of processes. And what else is that international cooperation? It was very interesting to hear from Tarmo about the history and about the initiative Sweden uh, took the role in that. So we have many good examples of especially Nordic collaboration, international collaboration and the role of United Nations. So as the former youth climate delegate of Finland, I find, find it very in, in important that we have this strong collaboration between uh, different nations and especially uh, also uh, in the global south and in the global north scale. So it's not only about as 
pursue very well um, explained and uh, had in, the, in, in, in discussion within these themes of social justice and climate justice and about racism and this um, capital scene and these different themes. So I think about climate and then I think about that we can't have climate justice without social justice. So that needs to be in the heart of all the actions we do within climate, within the city planning and within the biodiversity work and nature work, within everything we do. We need to have this social, social sp spatial, spatial lens on. And from Pursu's um, speech, it was very fascinating also your conclusion and your remarks from that, that how could be the welfarist and modernist city history in the Nordic context be rewritten? I think this is a theme and topic we should have more on the table and have a discussion on that. Uh, a lot more because when we come back to this start as i had we need to have this global justice and global responsibility um, lens also and approach to these problems and issues we are having so so um i think that was very important i would love to also have your thoughts on this more and maybe some answers to these questions as well and your own own insights if you we have time to uh, broaden this discussion a bit more. So thank you all for your speeches and your presentations and I wish to hear more from the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much Maya for a very prompt talk as well. No need to disturb me. Um, okay, um, now that we have about, um, how long do we have left? Um, we're finishing at about Quarter past, yeah. So, because uh, I want to involve the audience as well, and I really love the comments, and I'm sure that the panelists have uh, uh, a lot to answer. But if I give the floor to you, I don't know what happens. We will have no questions from the audience. So, let's say uh, five questions from the audience or comments very, very briefly and shortly in a row. And after that, I give um, uh, the floor to the panelists, um, uh, each one for a couple of minutes to reflect on anything that they would like to reflect on here. And later on, we will continue this discussion uh, in the reception and, and later in, in Fenia. So uh, anyone wants to pose a question? More, if you have a question. Yes. Yeah, I have a very um, concrete question and uh, mainly related to what Tero said about the urban mindset in this in this over complication and i was just kind of thinking what could be a solution to this i mean there's this okay now the researcher moves to the nice countryside house so then he becomes a rural citizen so but what is enough so how, how do we change it and is it even possible to change within our academic or activist perspective to have enough input that it's non-urban mindset or a coherent inclusive mindset Thank you, Moritz. Let's pass on to the next one. Yoni, yeah, you just keep passing on. Go ahead. So, uh, just questions at this point. Yeah, very briefly. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, this is uh, to Bursu. Um, um, it's it's really an interesting idea uh, about rewriting the history of, of the Nordic welfareist urbanism. I wonder how you how you see mm, the current. Uh, political mantra of sustainable development, will that play into that direction? Is, is sustainable development something that helps in rewriting this history or is it part of the problem? How do you see that? Thank you. Anyone else? Courageous minds, or shall we go with these two? Okay, we'll go. Okay, Ari, you can have the last one. Yes, thank you for the the panelists and, and the commentators. I have a short question to Terro. Did you say that sometimes you feel university as a home to you? Yeah. <laughs> that is something. Did I say that? Only half a minute. But I often feel also that our HEMA department is a home and also the university is home. And if I see the sessions, read the abstracts and there are so many nice papers about 
planetosi, planetoseen or complicated, very cacophonic concepts, I, I understand. But, but very important paper. But also, I feel that, that if we if if feel that this is our home in, in some, some way, I also feel that the university surrounding us is sometimes it's, it's lacking so much behind of the big questions of, of planetary emergency breakdown and, 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 and these cacophonic words. And, and sometimes I feel that if it's home, it's also that we are experienced, we are witnessing a colossal mismatch that our department, our university is not responding enough to the big crisis we are surrounded. What do you see to all of us that is this a home, how much this is a home for us and how much this is something that has, that is passé already? Oh, what a provocating question. Okay, now I give the floor to the panelists and we will begin with Bursu. Uh, so Bursu, you have um, exactly five minutes or a little bit less uh, to, to um, reflect on any of the comments that you like. Go ahead. I, I, I will answer the question. I think it's a very interesting uh, question. Um, I think the current sustainable urban development paradigm is the solution to modernist estates. Um, I think it's um, it's part of the problem and uh, how it is instrumentalized. Um, the modernist housing estates were part of the uh, close, uh, solidarity politics when they were uh, emerged. And now I think that solidarity is being broken uh, within the applications coming with sustainable urban development projects. Thank you. Okay, we'll take we'll take Tarmo's uh, reflections then next. So thank you for very very good comments, very very great questions. Uh, I kind of um, there was several, several things thought provoking. The kind of uh, the issue of uh, urban mindset and and of course. Uh, um, we should be also in, in, in that sense um, kind of aware and also critical what kind of uh, concepts we are using and what kind of categories we are using. And of course, uh, um, and this is also, uh, and, and, and through that also the kind of starting point of questioning and, and study matters that, uh, um, and this is also um, uh, argued that um, uh, that uh, the kind of let's say the approach of of planetary urbanization that uh, uh, that it somehow uh, extend the, extends the urban agency across the globe too heavily. So what is left somehow it takes the some agency away from the rural areas, um, and um, and I, I think we have to here be be also careful. Of kind of looking at the kind of agency of of non non cities non urban areas uh, and agencies, and also to understand this kind of rural urban relationships, and uh, and and it is somehow the and of course uh, the kind of um, the separating rural and urban. This is the old uh, um, already old kind of category making, um, but uh, if you think in, in reality and in the kind of uh, real life that often through the metabolism, urban and rural comes together when, when we think about the food coming to the city or when we think even like uh, that how we try to to approach the cities in the future, we try to integrate several kind of rural elements, uh, for example, growing own food, uh, having more kind of social life, which is somehow also a, a bit considered as a part of rural living. So my suggestion is that also to, to look this kind of uh, rural ur urban relationships more, more closely. And, uh, and second very short aspect uh, is, it is about the knowledge, what, what knowledge matters. And uh, I agree that this is, uh, this is very important. And, um, 
uh, and uh, and also need to careful to listen the people uh, who are kind of telling about the influences or effects of of of, of cities or urbanization um, what how they feel what are their worries uh, what are the kind of changes in their um, uh, lifestyle um, yep thanks Stella. Sanna go ahead thanks and thanks for the good comments and questions uh, I could comment on this kind of losing the touch to reality idea and something that you also said perhaps about the concepts. So I think in this whole planetary urbanization discussion, there is this risk that we or somebody could understand it as like saying that, okay, well, it's anyhow only about the cities and rural areas are kind of uh, important because they are linked to cities, but not because they are important in themselves. And these kind of uh, ideas, are th I think they are dangerous also in practice uh, because, for example, all these sustainability and climate change goals that we are having, uh, there is a risk that then people pursue uh, think that these are only urban projects and this is something that can be only achieved within the certain type of urban lifestyle. And these kind of thinking could further kind of you know, go, make two groups go further from each other. So it's like, it's the project of urban el elites and the others are then just, you know, uh, doing bad things for the environment and in general. So I think this is something that we need to somehow solve, perhaps with changing some terminology or hat or whatever it means. I don't know, I don't have an answer. <coughs> Then no one commented on this university question. It's kind of hard, but I agree to that, that it sometimes feels, at least personally for me, that all these university sustainability programs are only about like, okay, we have less working space for you. And then we get economic savings, and then we have a sustainability course, and that's it. But then the whole kind of academic lifestyle and everything it it involves, it's it's not discussed because it's it's a hard question. Thank you. I want to reflect on on Ali's uh, issue of of the homeliness of this place. Last time when I was here um, uh, hosting a Fenia lecture, which is a bit more than a year ago, we were talking about rurality, and we published a special issue on on uh, rural areas in the Nordic countries. And now, uh, the, the next time that I come here, we're talking about urbanity and the issues of, uh, of urbanization and environmental issues related to that. Uh, so it feels very homely to me, and I don't see a, a, a distinct, uh, sort of like a discrepancy there on, on, on focus on uh, reality or urbanity, but that they're cross-section. So uh, I feel very homely here. Thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, so Tero and Maya, do you want to uh, say some uh, last commentary words before we wrap up this, this panel? Is there something that you want to nail down before we finish? Yeah, I think Moritz brought up this notion of... Uh, uh, so first of all, I lied. I have been living in a city. Let's let's clear it out of the way. And we can't, yeah. It mostly happened in the winter time because of my fat, father's alcoholism. We had no money, but then... Um, uh, it got better in when you become adult and you could escape to the forest and fish uh, or of course in lakes but forest is a kind of a concept and uh, maybe I didn't have time to talk about snow change but I just want to maybe answer to Moritz that when we got together in, in with the Inuit people and the Sami people from Sweden and some of the Finnish fisher folks to uh, establish snow change which is the organization that i work for in 2000 24 years ago uh, it was the idea of raising the voice of the communities and perhaps it was done to address climate change already 20 20 years ago the inuits knew that the permafrost is melting and it's really bad 
so here we are in the future of 2023 and and uh, i guess it's we have failed in our mission because it's still bad but in order to answer to Moritz's uh, comment on how researchers move the villages, for example, and and could conduct research from there, and don't worry, this will be um, only 30 seconds. Uh, maybe this this is not a bad idea. It's not a bad idea. Um, I grew up in Koitajoki area in the summers here in Ilomantsi, and I saw a world that no longer exists. In the late 1970s, I was surrounded by old growth primary timber forests. All of them are gone. I saw some of the last unditched peatlands around Lake Nurajärvi. All of them are gone. And now Snow Change is spending 1.5 million to restore those peatlands. None of that makes any sense. Therefore, I call those of you who are in the science and in the world of uh, academia here to think about collectives, collectives in science. If the crisis is so bad, and perhaps you don't know about the fish, or you don't know about biodiversity, but you know about the cities, or you know about the nuclear dump, uh, can you pull up? There are organizations like BIOS that have done that. They have money, they have funding. And by reforming collectives in science, we tackle the, what Sanna said in a very good way, the production science, the, the fact that we are supposed to be producing, we are supposed to be hunting money constantly, administering that money, and then it's too stressful anymore to do anything because we made it. If we get the money, it's in a way already done. So those of you out there in the audience, maybe in the back row, you and you and you, Maybe you can think of forming a small collective to tackle how do we rescue landlocked Atlantic salmon from extinction. Thank you. Thank you. And Maya, you can have the last word. Thank you. Um, I think there are brought up the very important team of money. So maybe I would say that it's the fight between the values, all the aspects of sustainability and the money and how we can allocate resources on solving these challenges and crises we are facing. So um, I just think that we need to pull up, as Tero called you, and collaborate together, find this traditional knowledge to guide us as well within this work and save the salmon and all the um, uh, endangered species we can and yes, I think, I think we need to find new ways. We need to rethink, as Bursu said very well, we need to rethink many things and we need to rethink how to be more collective and more self-sufficient. So for example, to me, be and get this non-urban mindset as Moritz uh, mentioned, it's very important. I think this is the main take for myself, how to be non-urban and how to find ways to be more self-sufficient within and in, in the cities, and also to have the responsibility as the representative of the city of Joensu to also think about the rural areas. Joensu is not only the heart of the city, how we see it in the uh, centrum uh, map. We need to think about, say, about the um, villages nearby, uh, like Eno and Heinavara, where I lived. So I also have this kind of like non-urban uh, experience for myself. So yeah, th these are my main takes. How to be non-urban, I ask. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And before I ask uh, you all to join me in, in thanking the panelists and the commentators, I want to thank the uh, co-organizers of this panel because this was a really like something that we did together. I think we started about a year ago, uh, right after the uh, Tampere days, on thinking about, OK, what should we do next? And uh, the theme of the panel was uh, brought up by Ari. So Ari is responsible for this wonderful theme here and that we will organize a panel. I think it falls down to Moritz. Uh, we wanted to have a, a, a panel that has both um, male and female suspect uh, panelists and commentators, and I think we succeeded pretty well. And then um, uh, the Geog Geographical Society has uh, taken part in organizing the, the panel by raising some funds. Um, 
and uh, especially Kanerva Medveinen is someone to thank for, and Joni also as well. And from the, the Versus Journal, I want to thank specifically Anna Mustonen, who is now uh, practicing theatre somewhere, but she's at the same time uh, following us through her laptop and, and uh, videoing this, uh, this event and organising also so that the, the um, uh, other editors in, in Versus will then uh, edit uh, anything we come up with later on. And anybody else to thank? Ooh, uh, oh, all my um, uh, editor colleagues in Fenia, like Maya, who's here, and the others who will be working on everything that we come up with. And, uh, and uh, I'm really thankful uh, already for all the work that you're doing. And of course, everybody who came. So uh, thanks to the co-organizers. Thanks very much to the, to the wonderful panel. Thanks, Borjo, for being here, even though you're ill. Uh, it was really wonderful to, to get your presentation. We'll, um, we'll be in touch very soon about the, the publishing process. And thanks uh, to our excellent commentators. It's been uh, really a pleasure to host this, this event. And uh, when we, after, afterwards, when we've thanked everybody, uh, there's a reception uh, organized by all the co-organizers uh, that we can um, all join in and, and continue these discussions. So thanks, everyone.